Thanks everybody for coming out tonight for this uh, fall uh, uh, evening of the Movement Matters uh, Symposium Series. And thanks to all the panelists, uh, Matt uh, Rappaport, Edra Soda, Sean Lent, and Aaron Rose for joining me to have this conversation on the creative industrialization of social practice. <clears throat> uh, there's a, this is a, a big topic, and it's one that I uh, want to sort of set up a little bit by talking about um, the framework and history, and then sort of getting into uh, the work that each of you do, uh, which I think is significant in the city and in a larger sense uh, in terms of what social practice is about today. But historically, you know, there's a sort of, um, uh, if, if you looked at the Facebook event page for this, I took an image from Artist Placement Group, which was a group that was sort of significant in the history of uh, social practice for placing artists in residencies at corporations uh, uh, in the UK. And <clears throat> they, they were publicly funded for a number of years before the government sort of took over what they were doing uh, because they thought that it didn't qualify as art. Um, this idea of sort of building systems. Um, but social practice as this, as this background to that it goes back throughout the history of the avant-garde uh, to the very beginning uh, where you, you had the Italians, uh, for instance, um, trying to provoke audience members into participation by being outrageous on stage and saying things that were insulting and Front, uh, fronting to taste at the time. And it was all about sort of trying to get the public involved. And so you know, this whole history that goes back that Claire Bishop has been very, we mentioned earlier, uh, has been very uh, astute about reporting that looks at participation uh, as a central element uh, and how the public completes the artwork. And you know, this then threads through uh, another history that goes, uh, that brings, comes up through time up through performance through the dematerialization movement uh, um, uh, the 1960s. And Chicago has sort of become a center, and it is a center of the invention of these sort of new branching directions in social practice. So the, the, this history is sort of, uh, is all the context to what we want to talk about and how that's changed. And you know, I want to start this conversation because, uh, Andrew, you significantly um, just came back from Puerto Rico where there was a storm, the, the, the hurricane, and this horrible response by the American government. And I think, you know, when you think about social practice, it's always been this sort of social support aspect, uh, using art to foment positive social action. And I think you as an artist, experiencing that firsthand, I wondered, uh, first off, like, I'm glad that you weren't harmed. <laughs> and that, you know, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you, know, you were out of the of the worst of it, but also like what your impressions first had on that event were like and, and how like, you think that might influence your practice. Yeah, that's a great question. You talk about, um, I, I had uh, this this year, it's been the year where I, where I have been completely independent uh, as an artist. I've been traveling and uh, going to different residences exactly to do that, mm. to, to engage with different communities yeah. and people, uh, not only specific communities of the, the sector the, or the residents or the institution, but just people in general and how, how to weave, you know, the relationships. Yeah. Um, well, after, after this experience recently being in Puerto Rico and, and I actually went there before the hurricane to to be with my, my mother and, and, and see my brother and his family. And then uh, and then it was announced that this, because there was a hurricane already. There was an Irma that happened and I thought I should go and see what is happening and how they are doing. And, and then this was announced and very scary. I mean, it built up and, and, and then it, it I think a lot of people didn't believe, couldn't believe, because we, Puerto Rico famously is, you know, have, you know, have kind of dodged the, the big hit, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I always, I think about that, and I 
think about the different kinds of hurricanes that have gone through the island, and they like it hit it, but it doesn't really kind of lose so its power. Like and like the previous one loses power, so everybody was sort of like counting on that. But yeah, it was hours of serious information being fed to Puerto Ricans through through the right. media, you know, and and like. Man, this is this is gonna be this is gonna be it. This is gonna be, and it was it. It was really stressful to experience that. Um, I have I in my <laughs> in my art practice life. Mm -hmm. I have other engagements coming up, and including a <laughs> well. All I can say <laughs> right now is that it's, yeah. it it removed the pressure of you know. The regular pressure that you feel when you're doing things that are going to be publicly viewed, right. you know, I, I feel like there's a part of me that is completely shut off. Like I, I'm saying, yeah, things are going to get done and mm. this is going to happen. Mm. But I, yeah, at some point I, I, I'm there dealing with the aftermath with my family. I'm in a, in a uh, neighborhood that it's, it's an old neighborhood um, in the part of, of the uh, uh, San Juan area. And that was not the focus of the hurricane, but it, but it really destroyed the whole, the, everything. And all the landscape is completely transformed. And that's probably the most scary and, and, and sad, you know, depressing uh, thing to see things like completely just beaten to them to all, all it could be beaten, you know, that you're landscape. You're still processing the emotion and experience. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Even, even that it's, point, it's like, fucked mm -hmm. up. <laughs> <laughs> right? It is, it is. I cannot believe it. I felt, I felt somewhat privileged and, uh, because I, I felt I, that I know that, that that I didn't want through the worst. I, I experienced this place in a, in a shelter that hold, you know, that house that hold us, you know, intact. Like I wasn't hurt. I, and I could see the whole thing. It was very, very stressful, but I, I felt so lucky. And I've never been somebody that, that is, is uh, I'm actually somebody that, oh, I always try to, to think that I, I want to disengage with the material world more and more in my life and I, that's what I hope I I love art I think I we as you might know we have an art collection in our house but I, I think about those objects as things that have some life in them right. so like I I actually have got rid of trinkets and all things that I, I don't think I don't think they have real meaning and I just so have it's the parlor of your home too it's a you know the part of the exhibition in the basement um, and then the living exhibition of the Franklin are back through house. Yeah. 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 Well, that, uh, that, um, I Yeah, <laughs> I and that's a whole separate thing. It's a whole separate thing. I mean, but to, to sort of thinking about this, um, Sean, too, you, you, you have this long history of dance as activism. Uh, I think you've defined a lot of your social practice around sort of protest art right now. I think sort of taking it, what Andrew is processing, you, you, this is, as we were talking about earlier, you're experiencing this sort of, uh, Response to the culture in terms of the willingness to protest, um, and it's sort of to sort of take it on ebbs and flows, right? Yeah. Um, well, I maybe describe just a little bit. You yeah. Well, <laughs> I um, just to go back a little bit, I um, I always thought I was doing uh, community work, community-based work. Right. Uh, that's what dance the community uses a, uses a lot, and outreach to the community. Um, in reach, partnering with the community, and it was sort of similar things of living in Egypt where I realized like I am the community. This whole thing about like right. outreach and uh, the white savior syndrome and how what does a white American lady do in Flint, Michigan, do in Cairo, do in Bosnia? Like what is my role? Um, and it felt I was like this is not community-based work, and I don't want to do that. And I came across an article from Visual Arts that described social practice as an intervention. Um, and just give me just 10 seconds. 
Yeah, yeah. But this definite, I read this definition and it sort of changed my life. Um, it was in the New York Times in 2013 when I realized that I was, what I was doing was social practice. Um, I remember reading this and that's it. Right, you're, um, you're one of the few sort of uh, dancers who self proclaim themselves working in that mode, which I think is one of the so reasons I brought you uh, social practice are practitioners who mm -hmm. freely blur the lines among making, object making, it's visual arts, but making, performance, political activism, community organizing, and investigative journalism. Um, I'm a blogger as well. Uh, creating a deeply participatory art that often flourishes outside art spaces and systems. And in, suing, in doing so, these artists push an old question, why is art as close to the breaking point as contemporary art has ever been. Right. And that, I was like, that's what I want to do with dance. Um, and, and then Wikipedia, you know, I hate Wikipedia, but it is a place, <laughs> a place where people agree continuously, in changing, evolving agreement, which is exciting. But it's based, um, the, prop, the definition of social practice art there is human interaction. The art of social discourse and human interaction, <coughs> and that's that intervention, the art of creating human interactions. Yeah. Um, that's what I do, um, and that inspires. I can do that with therapists. I can do it with community-based artists who are so crucial to the work. So then, you know, what does this exact population, this point in time, in this place need? in designing an art experience, being art um, on the street as part of demonstration. Is it a class? Is it a dance class? Is it a performance for Syrian children and um, Orthodox Jewish children together? Um, is it interesting things in the lobby? <laughs> but it's designing the artful human interaction. So one of the things we do is people, especially dancers, felt removed from being part of demonstrations. Um, I was really a part of the demonstrations in Egypt for years, which are so artist-led. There's, even the farmers come out and do installation art. There's Zorba, the Greek ballet company, on the street. Um, there was 33 days of street performance as part of the 2013 um, demonstration. And my, um, my partner is, Egyptian came back, we went to a Black Lives Matter march, and his first comment was, where are the artists? And where are the artists? I think they're the ones with the clever signs. And so um, just creating a venue for dance artists to be in the community, but rather than that, to be of the community. So just a platform where artists could take it upon themselves to use their dance in, in a way of protesting or demonstrating or just celebrating outside. Some people don't feel like protest is their thing, but being with other artists, being with other citizens, uh, standing for something, moving for something, um, and it's changed. So, you know, during the election, it was pretty clear. Everyone was out, there was a lot of pink hats. Um, and as it's changed, um, you know, now it's more reactionary. Healthcare is up tomorrow. Who's anyone have four o'clock right. open on Friday? You mentioned and a bunch of like three weeks of planning time to a day and a half. Uh, yeah. Because it's so issue based and every day is a new issue. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then it's what do you have time to care about right now? Right. Um, yeah. So um, so it's changed, but the, again, the, the goal hasn't changed, which is the people, the place, the time right now, who wants to be involved and does it serve them? Great. Um, and that's what it's for. Um, it isn't so much a participatory nature of the audience. Sometimes they do join in, but it's specifically what's needed right now. I mean, I think that, you know, when we're talking about working in the street, so much of the work you do, too, is about the sort of mapping of the space, social space. Um, you know, I, uh, I've gotten to know you work well. Uh, and everything from, for example, like touristic intents to uh, the V1, V3. Uh, you're, you're sort of organizing built environments and looking at the histories and sort of, uh, you know, extracting that social meaning that usually recedes from the background of yes. these environments. <laughs> yeah, 
So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I usually think in terms of social practices that the, pra the projects I'm involved in are much more nibbling around the edges than fully invested in social practice as, as, as a form. But yeah, my projects typically do look at how we habituate spaces and try and work around strategies of intervention or um, building platforms for other artists to join in in either intervention or curatorial kind of uh, presence in those environments. Like the most recent project, though, I guess, traces into more of a participatory zone in terms of my own work, where the project is a, it's a live remixing urban spaces from a box truck with a large projector in the back and a live video feed. And people are invited to come and ride along and have discussions and then have both their image but also their words like remixed into that presentational. Right, this is for the architecture. architecture yeah, yeah, so that, that has me thinking a little bit more about um, participation. Um, right. And then also just curating uh, takes a big has a, has a place in these sorts of dialogues where right now I've been working, and I think a number of other folks have been working with the Terrain Biennial and bringing public art into neighborhoods, which provides that kind of idea of being of that community, which is always you know, difficult to come into a different community and try and make work, yeah. but to be from the community, bring in artists, kind of act as a facilitator, and develop interactions with your neighbors. Like It, it doesn't get much more personal than Right. And that's been really, um, I think, important for, for my particular neighborhood um, for a number of different reasons uh, around class and race and just kind of uh, gentrification patterns and that sort of thing. Right. Um, so the interactions have been quite amazing. Right. And Terrain, uh, which was, uh, uh, was founded by Spinoff, was on our last webinar. Yeah, it's sort of like, it's, we were talking about how it's sort of expanded now sort of around the country. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think what's happened with some of these initiatives is they become toolkits that then people can replicate models of these, you know, more local interactions in their own communities. And because they're being instigated by local artists or local hosts, there's credibility, right? And there's kind of, I don't know, it should be kind of like a skin in the game. There's the ability to translate local concerns into those frameworks. Well, part of the thing, uh, you know, with Tristan and Tess, this is the... Uh, um, documentary. Yeah, the documentary, a piece about, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what's the name of the resort again? It's Pura. So Pura. it's a German, right. it was a Nazi resort, mm -hmm. designed by the Nazis, never quite used except in propaganda, and then was a very important site uh, for the military under the socialist government, and now has been redeveloped as, redeveloped as a tourist site again under capitalism. Yeah, but there's sort of like this rooted history of fascism that you're interrogating with, through architecture in that, uh, in that film. And I, I think that you're sort of unearthing these, these histories is the challenge of a lot of social practice, right? It's like what's going on in the background that's sort of channeling us as people in one way or another. Um, and training, you know, I, I think that is sort of a pushback in a sort of like creative community sense, right? So, which, so this sort of, sort of like civic uh, uh, creative work Aaron, I, I, I sort of see you as the boss work of the um, ethical redevelopment salons, right? Like the Oscar Gates' uh, initiative to define what ethical redevelopment means and inviting the public in to have a conversation and help invent the meaning of what that uh, can be going forward through the salon series. Um, how, how would you describe where you see that effort as it manifested through this series and where you see it heading? Uh, this is interesting to me, in part because the gastric, in some sense, is like at the forefront of how people perceive what social practice is today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I come to this work from the community-based perspective rather than the art right. and culture perspective. Yes. Um, I've worked for many years with community-based organizations and other not-for-profit organizations and what I prefer to call uh, social impact organizations, and I'm a writer. And so for many years, I spent you know, time in a room by myself writing about what organizations were doing to help them raise money primarily. But it was really, I saw more as um, a necessary act of education, you know, educating people about issues people are dealing with. And um, the work is very important. 
um, the people who are doing the work are doing you know, incredibly vital work. But it's so problem-based. You know, whether we're talking about what I started out doing, you know, not too far from here in Wicker Park, working at a battered women's shelter, you know, to AIDS work and immigration work. I mean, all this stuff is so important. And yet, for me, it just, I just felt like after a while, this, it was kind of a, a churning wheel of dealing with very, very intractable or seemingly intractable issues. When I came into this realm of social practice, I mean, it was like a revelation to me of a creative way, a creative and, and sort of larger perspective way to address the same issues in a way that many people could participate and in a way, and I know this word can, you know, there's some controversy around this word, but truly is empowering. You know, allowing people to bring the best of who they are, their, their minds, their creativity, their heart, their, their actions, in a very public way, to changing the landscape and, and holding space for how things get addressed differently, whether it's violence against women or you know, issues around sexuality, any kind of politics, whatever it is you're talking about, is like a new arena for holding holding space for, for evolving or you know, addressing whatever it needs, that needs to be addressed. And um, the, the Salon series that, that the Astor Gates and the Place Lab team hosted was like a, um, a very focused um, experience around this work. Like what are people doing in, um, the people who participated in this series were from night funded cities, so uh, cities like Akron, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, and uh, Pittsburgh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and of course my, my hometown, Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, people who came together to talk about the projects they're doing in those cities, which are all about social practice, but they're really about changing place. Like, they're place-based. This is a real place, this is our community, this is our city. How do we change it? And so, then in a way, to me, it's like um, bringing together both, you know, the very physical and real world that we live in, what it looks like, how it operates, how it holds us or not, and what goes on there. Like, well, how do we imagine? You know, how do we live? How do we interact with each other? How do we create our culture? How do we want those places to operate for us? You know, what do we bring to that? So. Um, that your question, yeah, no, I, I, think, yeah, I mean, yeah, each of them was sort of surround, uh, was formed around a, a principle, right? So there's a list of principles. Nine, nine principles. Yeah. Nine principles for ethical redevelopment. But I love that one of them was indeterminacy, that yes, we hold so space for not knowing. Yes, yes, <laughs> and, and, and for trying to see where things go. And I think, so this is, this is sort of where we're at, right? It's like this question of social practice now being used to transform cities, being used to transform social behavior, culture, and we're looking at the, the ways in which that's done in a larger sense. And I think, like you said, funders like Knight are involved. Like there's a big, there's a big backing movement on some segments of it, other segments not so much. But so this is this question I have of like, the, the title of this, of this supposedly like creative industrialization, but that comes out of this, uh, uh, it's a reference to the creative industry that was theorized by Richard Florida. You know, folks like, uh, like the sort of where things came together between art, advertising, film, museum, the whole aspect of it. There, there's, there's been some transformation in terms of the industrialization of sort of creative work, right? Uh, in, in positive and negative ways. So, you know, Matt and I have talked a lot, for instance, about uh, uh, the introduction of the PhD the studio practice, uh, the increasing uh, sort of push for greater arts school enrollments, um, other things like uh, uh, museum blockbusteritis, like these are things that have been described and, and sort of complained about in the art world and outside of it, uh, increasing marketization around visual performing arts, uh, proliferation of art fairs, uh, the increasing focus on celebrity. Uh, so you know, I think when we're talking about you know, this, this sort of industrial industrialization of it, like when we're talking about prora, you know, we, we, you're looking at like how industrialization of leisure time, 
uh, transformed how people were able to have downtime and, and how they thought about it. You know, now when Whole Foods gets bought up by Amazon, it, it, it transforms how we think about where we get our food. And you know, these sort of industrializations and information technology transformations that happen. But I just I want to sort of open up the panel to some perceptions about how you see that changing the role of uh, the artist uh, and of social practice, and then we'll sort of move on to another section of this conversation. But I think, you know, originally social practice was established, was established to sort of push back against bottom line thinking. And there's this industrialization in a sense that's now being used by people to sort of make fortunes with it. And, and I think, like I said, we had this conversation earlier where it's not everybody, but there, there's a sort of like, this is a viable means to a career path now. And it's sort of, then I think the determinacy sort of gets removed a little bit, perhaps, because it becomes more professionalized. Do you feel like that's something that's happening in social practice or in the arts in general? I can talk about academia. <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 that's a segment of it. Uh, or, you know. or, or I think that, 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 there, that in some ways the success of social practice and the importance as a backstop against the over commodification capitalization of, yeah. of, of professionalizing art, right? A number of people have gotten into creating really exciting curricula around social practice. But the fact that now you have these systems to output young students, right, who are interested in pursuing this, the good side is we have more people doing this good work. The bad side is now it's also an army of people who see particular ways of solving problems. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know. I think, I think there's like a there are two sides to this coin, right? That maybe the success of social practice or the moment of social practice shows its success as a, as a model that, that, again, holds back or responds to what I see as a larger pattern of income inequality that translates into the art world where we have people who are like superstars, you know, on the blue chip doing the art fairs and all that. And then there are a lot of people who are like, I, I want a community, I want to make stuff, and who am I making stuff for anymore? How do I have impact? Right. If, if my end goal isn't just a fat paycheck, right? right? But I also think that the other side of it is, and, and I probably shouldn't speak out of, out of like a, a research background on this, but there, there is, at the same time that social practice rises, so does user experience as, as an area of study, so does design thinking. Mm -hmm. So taking the kind of creative practices that both artists and designers have, and instead of applying them just to like, hey, I'm gonna make that sweet thing, that that amazing website. It's really about taking our skills and training them on bigger systems and bigger kinds of problem solving, bringing in an interdisciplinary methodology that brings together yeah. social science and political economy. And um, I was going to grab one more thing there that, that was really exciting at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but we're bringing uh, right. oh, ethnography, to right. 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 anthropology and ethnography together to reshape how we think about our practices. And I think that generally, performance studies would be the other thing yeah, that also right. is on the rise simultaneously. Yeah. And so I think this like, interdisciplinary moment helps to make these forms. Right. And then what we do with them, and, like how do they enter into the economy? How do they sustain themselves without being totally commodified? That's right. really Well, you know, I want to jump back to Ed right now, because I think you've had, a, you've had a, a lot of success working in areas that aren't necessarily about that commodification. And that, and that have now sort of charted a path around it. If you, it seems like you're, you've got a successful model of that going. No, no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, many of the things that you have mentioned, um, <laughs> we can be our second hour. <laughs> My experience um, with this particular situation, but okay, I'm going to try to make my story short. Yeah. But um, so, Maybe some of you know I'm going to be having an exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Arts. It's opening on October 21st. Uh, my exhibition inaugurates what is called the Commons, which is the social engagement exhibition space at the Museum of Contemporary Art, which is basically the education department moving to the second floor of the museum, so it's in between the two main galleries, is this area that have been uh, designed by uh, um, two Mexican designers, 
theater sound, uh, and uh, I, I was invited um, last year to, to do a project. And I wasn't really sure, but I was I was about to hit what I'm what I'm what is what is that I've been developing this year, which is a project called Open Twenty Four Hours, which uh, comes from a very personal place. I I live in an area of Chicago it's called East Garfield Park, and uh, um, my motivation comes from from the littering there's a mm -hmm. there's a lot of very particular littering in that area in that sector that is framed by the center for green technology and garfield park conservatory that boulevard which i i go out and walk every day uh, with my dogs i i see the kind of garbage that is there and i've been doing this for a long long time and like maybe four years ago I start, I start grabbing these bottles of, of tequila, of Patron, and, uh, because there were so many, and I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with them. I don't know what this means. And then eventually, I, I had to recycle them. I didn't know exactly what that meant. But this year, last year, at the end of the year, I start again, I'm like, there's all these bottles, and they're like incredible, and they're expensive. And there's, this is a food desert. There's right. no, yeah. you know, there's, <laughs> there's one restaurant kind of like in one particular area, but it's, there's nothing there. There's no supermarkets, but there's one liquor store right in the middle of, of that particular boulevard, Franklin Boulevard. And uh, so, yeah, I'm thinking that they, all the bottles are coming, a lot of the bottles are coming from there. But what really helped me understand the meaning of, of this, these bottles was listening to the radio. I like to listen to hip hop and rap because I just have black women in me. <laughs> that is very vibrant. And I, I like to listen to this music that is not very appropriate many times. And, and I just, it's a vicious thing that I do. I just, I think I, I, I like to think that I, I want to understand it. I also like some things about it. I'm really, of course, don't don't agree with many <laughs> things about it. But this this really helped me understand the meaning of the bottle. So I I'm listening to this song of Drake called For Free. If you heard that song, it's a very dirty song. It's, about, it's talking about the, Drake being, um, you know very uh, capable <laughs> and uh, he um, he's saying in the song that he got off the Hennessy and uh, I was like oh my god I have all these bottles of Hennessy and what this means and so I've been teaching uh, research at SAIC for four years now and I, I think I never uh, kind of really apply this to the core, to like very one-on-one, I'm gonna do research. I, like if I was a student, this, what is this? I live in this neighborhood, this is the drug that I'm getting from there. Uh, so I researched their relationship in between African-Americans and cognac, which is, was the liquor that I was finding the most. And this, there's a history that goes back to the 19, 30s and 40s when there was a, the, the two world wars were happening and the black soldiers were introduced to cognac uh, uh, in France. So cognac is made in France and at that time African Americans were being oppressed in the United States but their music was being celebrated in France. Right. Yeah. Especially like you know the blues mm -hmm. and uh, Josephine Baker was really accepted very famous there. And, and and that was that was it for me. Okay, that 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 open is is like having <laughs> the history in your right. in your front yard. And and I think the most amazing part that that, that I find of the project is that I I have I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bottles. Yeah. 
So that is, this is not fiction. This is this is the reality of like going every day and finding five, ten, two at every day, and I clean them and I I document it and I, I document every part of it. Uh, sometimes I was thinking for my own amusement, <laughs> but it turned out that there, there's gonna be a couple of exhibitions about this. Um, but from all the all these bottles. It's very rare that there is a bottle of, of whiskey in, 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 in that. In, oh, there's, there's vodka, there's um, tequila, and a lot of cognac. Hmm. So this is a historic African-American neighborhood that, that is, is, you know, there's people of all kinds living there, but, but it's still in its majority. Um, African Americans. I'm not. I had some worries because I am not African American. I'm Puerto Rican. I, I, I'm a mix of things, including black, and and have I have addressed the African diaspora that in uh, through uh, Puerto Rico. But um, there's. I've been living a decade in that neighborhood, yeah. and that is and that is a very special place for me. I'm not judgmental. I love drinking as well. <laughs> so I definitely. Cheers. Thanks for our sponsor, Revolution Brewery. Yes. <laughs> I, I think about it as a, as a document yeah. that, that talks about democracy, about how people yeah. decide what they are going to consume. Well, this is, and it, this is exactly the point. Now, there's, there's a sort of like, what you're doing is, is, in a sense, a critique of the consumer culture. Of the people. Well, the, the, yeah, the hip hop and rap instigate that, that, kind, that kind of consumption because it's, it's, it's uh, attached to uh, glamour. You know, yeah. like it's, this is the, the cognac or the champagne, or it's part of, it's a one component of uh, different artifacts that, that you need to have to, to embrace that life. Right. You know? Well, it says too, it's also, <laughs> it's also about this sort of like preservation of these cast away objects, right? Which, you, as you point out, still have value. Yeah, well, um, th there's different things how these objects to me operate, and, and their evidence, they, 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 yeah, they track, you know, what is, what is happening, what is being consumed. And yeah, it, 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 the, releva, the revelatory as well. They, they unveil that, that connection. Um, so I, I, you know, for, for this exhibition, oh man, you're gonna have a fist. <laughs> when you know what I've been going, I've been going through, Getting because off. this was not, this was not an easy yeah. thing to, to do. I, I, you know, I'm not, I've been doing art for so many years. I, I, I've been here since 2000, so I've, it's like 17 years. Um, just uh, understanding how like you can you can give visibility to others, and you 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 work with others. You don't need an institution. You don't need a, a you don't need a, a you know a commercial. Right. career to be an artist and that that's kind of like what people that do grad school like I did is sort of like the thing that you you attach to success but I just couldn't make I couldn't make something I, I needed to feel I needed to feel like and I, I, I need to say something through an experience mm -hmm. and that's how that's how I, I work mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's a really critical point because I think that there's this transformation of experience into product so often, right? That you know, we, the conversation in, in many recent years has been that neoliberalism sort of absorbed the avant-garde in the early 1990s uh, and began to sort of transform cultural product into uh, you know, culture and product and experience into product and, as opposed to into art. And to use that art not for the purposes uh, of the historic environment, which was to restore the social bond, or uh, activist purposes to uh, reconnect uh, 
communities that have become atomized. And I think that there's this like interesting thing that's happened with it in Chicago in particular, where we're sort of outside, we're in a bubble here, sort of outside the sort of coastal influence of supply and demand around art, which I've always sort of found fascinating. And in this history of social practice around it then, a participatory era, uh, so I guess the question that sort of leads me to now is like looking at that history and um, Aaron, I want to sort of put this one in your in your corner a little bit because I think you know it, theater, for instance, is very much trying to be disruptive of uh, the sort of civic planning in the city, and you know some of the found objects, just like Entra picking up the bottles, is uh, theater trying to save a root from a church, and that's the found object that becomes the exhibition object, right? Uh, and, and historically, which these these are you know the sort of found object history is a sort of a slice of that, but what it's about is something that's not present in the room. It's about the loss, the church or the gazebo. The gazebo. Um, yeah, let's open that to you guys. I know there's a lot about that. Well, you know, and I hope, I hope that I'm responding to your question, but what I was thinking about when yeah. you were talking, Edra, is that, you know, here's a, here's a history, like those facts on the ground that people don't know. Not so, everybody, not yeah. everybody knows. Not everybody. That, that, uh, that was very surprising to me too, because yeah, that now I'm working with all these artists, and uh, a lot of them are African American. Some of them did know, some of them didn't know at all. And, and to me, I felt like it's very significant, because I, I didn't know as well, I learned, right. you know. Right. And I think we have a whole city full of people. We have a whole society full of people who don't know a lot of things about a lot of people. And I think especially African Americans in this country. Um, and so just to tell the story of something real, like, you know, instead of, oh, look at this neighborhood, it's full of garbage. Well, what does this garbage have to tell us? What does it have to teach us? And it's not, as, you know, when you said, I didn't want to make something, you, interpreted something from what is there. Those are facts, right? And so um, that's what I see in terms of what we we can do with place. And I, you know, like off the top of my head, I'm not sure that I can speak exactly to how the Astro's work fits in this, except that he is very, um, I to say this, there's a sort of faith, uh, faithfulness to place. Like, what does this place mean? Let, this, let the place speak to us. Let's not impose something on this place or on this community. What does this place have to tell us? And in fact, to ally the community to the making, the process of our making. Exactly. That's been a hugely important part of these yeah. projects, like the St. Lawrence School, um, which was saved, you know, with a church that wasn't saved, that you right. said that yeah. you saved the bricks. Um, but the church, and then this actually the, the, um, the powerhouse, part of that powerhouse connected with Garfield Park, where they're going to do the project. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and then that's that wonderful power station in the Greater Grand Crossing area, which was a it was a power station um, that's going to be converted into, you know, what I hear, or what I've heard is that it's it's going to be used as um, sort of rehearsal space for the the um, monks, the Mississippi monks. Oh, okay. That that. Performance group that he had, um, but again, it's you know it's, to me it's it's more about letting the space and the history and the people who are there speak, speak, and, and that's a tremendously creative act to allow that information um, to come forth and then to do something with it that means something. Right. I think that's that's, that's what everyone here is trying to do to some degree or another, right? Is to give voice to the voiceless. But to find ways to recover these histories that have been erased, oppressed, or otherwise sort of uh, redlined out of how we build our society. So I think that that's a powerful idea that art can do that. But that I think that there are also some challenges. And I, you know, as, as, as much as I think the actors doing amazing things, there are also questions about how much does this qualify as gentrification without. You know, I, I don't think it does. I think he's preserving black culture as much as he's sort of bringing money and uh, funding into the neighborhoods. Or, you know, there's always this question about artists sort of spearheading the development. And 
So you know, th those are uh, sort of open questions, but uh, you know, I, I, I think in, in Chicago, it, 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 there's, there's a sort of uh, history around that preservation that in the scales of it seems to me uh, to be of value overall. Uh, and I, so I, I, kind of going to this, the, the point of what I, I think is, is the crux of some of this, you know, I, historically there's this always this question of sufficient disruption, right? So to what degree do these projects or these attempts to bring light into the race areas or, you know, or to highlight these forgotten histories, to what degree do these projects kind of mount a sufficient disruption of the, the sort of historical, populist, nationalist, whatever sort of influences that were driving that red line, that were creating these lost histories. You know, I, 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 here's an example of this. Like, you know, I, I, uh, some of you may, may, may know the um, uh, art critic and artist, actually, uh, Patrick Collier, some years ago at the um, uh, 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 Portland Open Engagement Conference, there was a conversation between uh, Collier and Casey Zott. Uh, they were talking about this artist, Fritz Hag, uh, you know, <coughs> as, uh, who had worked as part of open engagement in which uh, it was an eagle's nest situated on the ledge of a hotel building in Manhattan. Um, and it was so intended to, to foment a conversation about the displacement of nature in those environments. Um, and Collier contended that the work was too passive, that it didn't do what the artist intended, that they were supposed to think of that, and, you know, so there was this back and forth about sufficient, dis sufficient disruption. And then it was the work too passive. And I think this is where the question about <coughs> social practice and its creative industrial relation kind of hits a point where is it serving something other than its stated purpose? And I think there's a sort of like mass, sort of you know, turning out of like artists to can work in this in a safer way, but it, is there a point of sufficient disruption or not? Is this something that you guys think about when you're making your work? Does it have to be socially disruptive at that point? I, That's an open question for this, the panel. I'd like to speak to this a little bit. Yeah. Because um, I've been, um, you know, for the first time, probably like two years ago, was applying for artist grants and not yeah. community-based or dance educator. Usually that's where they put you. Oh, you do community-based dance education and, and all of your goals have to be around what people are learning. And it was about personal and educational development, maybe community development goals. Um, and I was like, no, no, I'm making art. <laughs> and, and, and then they were like, okay, show us your work sample. And, and then and, and then. Well, you can see in this video, or, you know, the goals of my art are, you know, it, it's different for every context, but I started to do measurements and measuring the success of the intervention. Evaluations. Yeah, um, but, so, did my art produce uh, physical trust and a new way of spatial interaction between two groups that weren't looking each other in the eyeball, you know? And I brought in a dance movement and analyst people mm -hmm. to really look and measure that. Are we spaced differently? Are people of different race and religions interacting in new ways? Is that, and then I can prove it. <laughs> I have this, and my art is doing that. Um, so the video is a lobby, and you see people moving around. And actually, the performance was separate, but if you want to see the outcome of the art, the social practice, you have to look at the social interaction of the people. So I was able to prove, like, that's my art. Right. It, so it, you can draw one to one, say, yes. things that there was an outcome. This is the intervention we were looking to have, and this is where it's, and now they don't have any dance anymore, but it inspired a, a young entrepreneur to design their own music practice or something. So it, it inspired other things, it did these things, but able to measure the truth. And that's my art. And I was trying to figure out what I'm good at, because I wasn't, they are like, you're not really an art maker. You're not really an educator. You're not good at those things. And I was like, I'm the only one that could go into this area of Bosnia and make this happen. So I'm doing something of value that not a lot of artists can do, not a lot of educators can do. And 
trying to find value in that and what that skill set is. And I'm just seeing, going back to the question about you know, young artists coming up, um, the commercial pressure on dance is big right now yeah. with TV and just the number of people that are growing up is like dance is going to be your future. I work in the public housing unit and there was actually a, an, um, a grandmother who told her daughter, pay attention in this dance class because right. this could be your only future. I was like, this is, now it's become like basketball. Like, you've got to learn dance. Um, so that pressure and all the commercial dancers growing up in this, and then we have this generation that's in school right now that are craving to do good in the world. And they, when they find out that they can do dance as social practice, and that making art is a human right, it's Article 27 in the, you know, in the um, Articles of Human Rights, that there's a whole generation that are in college or just coming out of college right now who are, like, they're, they haven't been totally commercialized, they want to do good with art, they can't define it yet. So right now, in, like a lot of universities, arts, dance departments want to talk about this because, you know, the big, 10 years ago, it was like, you have to learn entrepreneurial skills. You can't just go to auditions. And now it's, you not, not only do you have to learn business skills to be a dancer, you also can do good things. And helping people find out what that means for them, um, as loose as that, that's like a new thing in college. Of like, you can have social impact. It's like, thank you school. So it's interesting to see where this goes now that when these kids that grew up on commercial dance start going into that, if it were reverse back. Well, I think that sort of split of choreographic uh, perspectives and in dance into performativity and into performance work is this sort of new platform like you know, Frank Rollins, who showed here recently uh, at the Berliner, and you know, worked with Tina Segal. They're, they're talking about <coughs> these new ways of engagement uh, or social interaction that um, hadn't been done quite the way in which they're doing it, using dance as a platform for that. But to speak to, you know, I, I just, the, so, the social practice element, I just had a, for instance, a, uh, in my own experience, an Illinois Arts Council grant rejected because it was social practice, because it was an individual artist making a social <laughs> uh, construct, and because there were other people involved, it couldn't be an individual artist's work. And I find that fascinating on the point of, now there's a sort of limit to what you're told you're able to make. Like the funding dictates the kind of work, right? And you're in public art, for instance, uh, that program, which the Department of Cultural Affairs, included a lot of dance mm -hmm. this year. But I, you know, I think that they're also, they were looking for social practice, and I think that there was sort of a narrow definition of that. I wonder to what degree, and maybe this is gonna, goes back to you again, uh, Aaron, it's like, you know, to what degree is that funding seen as allowed, uh, or, you know, to, it, sufficiently disruptive, right? Mm -hmm. is, it, is, it, is it narrowing our definitions, you know? It's a question that comes to first today. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it goes both ways. It's like anything that becomes sort of a critical mass, and then they say, oh, well, we need to fund this now because this is what people are doing, or they want to be ahead of it. You know, they want to be seen as the thought leaders so that they'll embrace something. Um, but I think, you know, funding is, is really a problem in that. Um, because this is public like, funding model now. Pardon me? Yeah, because it's not just yeah, the private so side of it. Little, it's commercial. Different. It's yeah. different with it is it's different with public funding. But um, years ago, I remember somebody saying that you know, in in the early days of social impact work and philanthropy, the social impact organizations were driving the agenda and they were educating funders about what they were doing. And then it slowly over time sort of flipped, mm -hmm. so that the funders have an agenda that they expect right. their grantees to meet. And that's very different. And I hope we're getting more towards a balance with that. Because um, artists, that, you know, again, that area of indeterminacy, they're operating perhaps outside of expectations. Right, right and that's right, and that's the whole point. Um, yeah. Right. I think that's a good point to <laughs> land on, right? <laughs> Let the artists lead the way. I think. Um, uh, I think. You know, I don't know if you guys feel like doing a little open Q and A at this point. Or is that, yeah. Sure. Yeah. We take a few questions. 
Okay, so uh, we'll open up with you guys. We'll take a few questions for the panel uh, uh, on any of the things we've been talking about tonight. Okay, yeah. Art is part of life. Art is 
physical <laughs> pain inside, like thinking, am I really gonna bring this here because of a series of, of conflicts that went from personal to just not, not, not meeting my expectations and um, uh, I, I would <laughs> this is interesting because well, it, it, has, it really this is actually right. Yeah, I think talks about this the This is thing. why your work is so socially relevant still. It's like that it has a problematic stance to the institution, which doesn't necessarily take the artist's perspective, right? And it doesn't necessarily always advocate for the artist's perspective because it has its own self-interest. I mean, you can go yeah, back. This, is, this is an institution where it focuses on celebrity, yeah. on uh, for profit. Mm -hmm. so, Perhaps maintain the institution, but I, you know, um, there's all kinds of things related. To contemporary to art. It, 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 this is this is where the tension lies with contemporary art and social practice. We we're advocating for activist yeah. ideals. Or I actually ideas. question what 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 is what is going to happen. You know, what, how this, is this going to be a real sustainable thing in that institution that is more and more uh, openly like. Celebrating celebrity. Well, I mean, this is, this is, these are problems that go back to when Louise didn't speak up on behalf of Hans Haki when he was kicked out of the Guggenheim. I mean, there's history around this where contemporary art has problematized itself in the world because institutional support has been such a, a strong uh, influence in how art's presented to the public. So the, 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 these are issues that I think it's a, probably another panel. <laughs> Um, let's, let's take one more question because we're, we're going along. If, if, if anybody has a little bit of I think it's more of a statement than it is a question. And I'm not trying to be hyper focused on Heather's work, but there is an internal critique within the African American community about who controls the means of production and who controls the means of distribution where you'll see within African, commun African American communities across the United States that those liquor stores are not owned and operated by African Americans themselves. Mm -hmm. And you right. see that with gas stations, corner stores, and bodegas that are set up in the African American community. What's interesting though is that those spaces tend to be occupied by immigrants from other countries a strong presence of Eastern Asian Im immigrants and a strong presence of Middle Eastern immigrants. And I'm all for entrepreneurship and also, you know, immigrants advancing themselves by whatever means necessary. But it's, it, you're almost documenting an energy flow, I would say, or reverse engineering an assembly line that speaks to the dis disenfranchisement of a people within their community and that they don't own the means of production or distribution and that they're net consumers. Mm -hmm. So in that, that's an aspect of your work that jumped out at me in that a lot of people who are African American and working within that community um, are having this internal debate, but I don't think that other people are recognizing that African American communities are for sale in a sense. Like, you know, you, it's the place that you go to set up shop and extract value, extract resources in pursuit of your own personal advancement. I mean, as a disclaimer, um, I am black, but I'm not African American. Both my parents are immigrants. I'm part Latino, that's a different story. But I'm always gonna be perceived through the lens of blackness. Like people will see me as a black man and assume that I'm African American and the descendant of an American slave and not know about my Afro-Latino background. So I have a vested interest in how that community is perceived. to critique that system of who owns and 
and also it, can we get fresh vegetables in the liquor store and they're doing that and also a mural on the west side formerly the Lupe Fiasco Foundation also doing work um, in those liquor stores using art getting the kids to get their first passport um, but also talking to the shop owners and developing that relationship and critiquing it and having more dialogue um, across uh, ethnic lines, across racial lines, across social um, class. So it's been really interesting. Um, and I just realized we didn't really do it today. It is Indigenous Peoples Day. Oh, so we should acknowledge, oh, yeah. we should acknowledge right. that we are in the traditional land of the Mayan yeah. peoples. Yeah, great, thank you. Yes. I, I think that that recognition is, these, these things always go like a third longer than I think they will, but I think that that encapsulates this conversation um, really well, that we do that recognition. And I, uh, I want to take a moment to recognize everybody who helped make tonight happen, uh, Joseph Ravens, uh, the Defibrillator Gallery, uh, uh, Resolution Brewing, and uh, yeah. our panelists, Matt Rumport, Sean Light, if so, and Air Rose, thank you all for coming out tonight as well and for being such a lovely audience. Um, and to all of you viewing this, when it finally comes out as a documentary series, we're working on it, uh, making. Uh, make sure to check out our Facebook page, Movement Matters Columns, facebook.com slash Movement Matters Columns, uh, for updates uh, as we're moving forward. Uh, and to read the actual columns that appear on Art Intercepts, which uh, sort of create an archive of dancing performance in the city. Uh, thanks for viewing and keep tuning in. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. That's great. I did not. Uh, I feel free to hang out and like drink oh, yeah, beer yeah. and like yeah. have whatever's there in oh, the yeah, conversation. Yeah, okay. well, we will hang out and chat with one another. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's great to know that people recognize these problems that are